Hi, my name is Paco, and uh, very grateful to be here. Uh, we have a Apache Spark tutorial today. Um, by the way, just to get started, if anybody's just coming in, we have some password slips uh, that we're going around the room. So if you don't have one of the password slips already, there's more we have up front. Uh, just raise your hand if you don't have one. You don't have okay, one. Great, great. He doesn't have, so. And also while we're doing that too, the other preliminary is uh, I've got some slides here. Uh, if you want to download these, I've put them up on an edge network. Uh, it's probably good to have the slides locally because I'll be going back and forth between code and looking at some different web pages. So um, that should be, shouldn't be too long of a download. It should be pretty quick. It's on an edge network. Um, let's see. So getting started. Uh, uh, I had been at uh, Databricks. Uh, everybody here, have you heard of Databricks? Or uh, anybody heard of Databricks? I guess I should. Have. Okay, good, 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 good. good. <laughs> okay. Um, well, better yet, have you heard of Spark? How many how many folks have been working with Spark before? Great. Uh, so, so Databricks is the company, uh, the people who created Spark, uh, Matei Zaharia and uh, my. Uh, uh, Jan Stoika, uh, previously uh, my boss, and uh, as well as a lot of the committers, majority of the committers for the Spark project are at Databricks, and they're, uh, they're helping to support and move the project along as well as commercializing some uh, products based on it. Um, and I was there for a little over a year helping to build out their training and certification and uh, open source evangelism program. Uh, so I, I was fortunate to be here last November. I, I recognized some familiar faces. We had a tutorial uh, in November about Spark as well. Uh, but there have been a lot of updates. And so this, this uh, project runs uh, very rapidly. Uh, there's a contract where the Spark project has a contract with Apache Foundation. They're supposed to push a new release every 90 days maybe give or take 10, 15 days sometimes. But generally speaking, every three months they push out a new release. And uh, a lot of those are just point releases, but uh, when I was here last time, I believe we were on Spark version 1.1, and now we're already into Spark uh, 1.4, looking towards 1.5. Um, so it's been moving very rapidly. Um, also, as far as my background, uh, I have been working with uh, these folks who created Spark. Uh, I met them doing a guest lecture at Berkeley uh, years ago, I think about seven years ago. And I'd, I'd previously been on a project called Mesos. Apache Mesos is what Spark came out of, and I was chief scientist for Mesosphere. Um, these days, I'm the director of, um, director of O'Reilly Learning. It's a new business unit out of O'Reilly Media. And uh, we're responsible for learning platforms and learning processes all across the company. Um, but we are using Spark, too. Alrighty. So um, let me just jump in here. We've got these logins that are created on Databricks Cloud. Uh, so everybody should have a password slip. And again, if you don't have one, raise your hand. We've got some more up front here. OK, great. We can pass some back. There's Amir's got some. Um, They'll, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I could show, may I take an example of one of those? Great, yeah, let's go on. So uh, on here, there's a, at the top, it's got a URL. And then uh, when you navigate there in your browser, uh, it'll prompt you. Um, there's a username and a password. And, uh, and then there's also a home folder. I'll show more about using the home folder in a bit. Um, and if you, if you want to see more information about this, uh, Databricks Cloud is a way of running uh, cloud-based notebooks that are backed by Spark. And you can run code that is in Python, Scala, SQL, or R. Uh, there are some updates, actually quite recently, just in the past few days, a new release of this has gone out. And uh, Ali Kodzi, who had been a PhD student here, right? At, at, uh, so Ali is now uh, VP of product I believe VP of Engineering also, at Databricks. And uh, he had a, a recent article about some of the new things in Spark that are, are being shown here. Um, in particular, uh, there is a release out 1.4. And this provides support for R, um, which is relatively recent. I'm not going to be showing a whole lot of R today. I'm, I might. If there's examples, I can bring that up. Uh, primarily, I'll be showing work in Python and Scala 
as well as some SQL. Um, but uh, if, you, if you want to see more, uh, Ali has a pretty good article there. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, if you go to the URL then that is at the top of the password slip, uh, browse to that and use the login credentials, user and password. Uh, once you log in, you'll see up in the top left-hand corner, there is a, a navigation menu. So if, if I go over to that um, right here. Uh, so if, if I log into Databricks Cloud then, uh, up in the top left, there is a navigation menu, the three bars. And under that, uh, workspace. Primarily, we'll be working with workspace. Um, so let me just go through some of the slides here. Uh, the workspace is a way of navigating through different folders. And so we have some materials already up online. There's, there's one folder called Spark Camp that we'll be using for um, the slides, the notebooks associated with the slides. And there's also different home folders as well. Uh, there's a, a guide that gives more information about this, as well as uh, some of the code for a recent book called Learning Spark. Um, if you want to look through the guide, there's a, a number of different notes there. It's not, I'll, I'll talk through all of them. Uh, but if you want more detail about some of the more advanced features, there, there's some great uh, background there. Uh, how many folks have used notebooks before, such as Zeppelin, IPython, uh, Jupyter? Okay, awesome. That's great. Uh, I know that there are also some commercial examples that go back even further. I think that uh, Mathematica has had notebooks for a while. But this is based off of using uh, notebooks similar to, like I say, IPython and Zeppelin and all. Uh, Project Jupyter is the latest incarnation of this out of Berkeley. It's a, a research project for uh, uh, taking IPython notebooks that have a number of different kernels behind them, such as Spark and Scala. Um, and I work pretty closely with the Project Jupyter team now. Uh, we were actually just camping this weekend, uh, some of us. So uh, notebooks, if you haven't seen them, the idea is this. You have a document. It has a number of cells. They're arranged in a linear order. And the cells could be either code, code that is running Python, Scala, uh, in this case, SQL, R. Uh, there could be other types of kernels behind. Um, the, the cells could also be the results of what happened when you compute the code. So for instance, if you're running some type of analytics and it generates a visualization, then the visualization might be the, the output cell. Um, also markdown. So is everyone here familiar with using Markdown, such as GitHub flavored? We've seen, have, who's, who's seen Markdown? This is all the, all the same. Markdown is all the same. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been around for a while. But if, if you use GitHub, of course, yeah. Markdown is yeah. the readme files, that kind of thing. So the, the cells can have structured text. They can have rich text. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, uh, Markdown, uh, in other kinds of notebooks, you can see HTML5, <coughs> LaTeX, uh, a variety of different text formatting. Um, and, uh, and the idea is that you have this linear flow of cells, and you can compute uh, different sections of your application in the code cells, see the results, and then have some descriptions uh, describing uh, that, that um, provide more detail about what the code is doing. We'll show a lot of examples of this today. Um, one other thing I should mention is that the notebooks have uh, features for import and export, as well as syncing to a code repository. So anything that's developed here, uh, it can be exported as the source. For instance, if you have a Scala notebook that you're creating, uh, you can always export that as a Scala module. And now, more recently, um, there are features that allow this to sync up to a, a GitHub repository, so you can keep all your changes. Um, okay. So uh, if you go to uh, back to the, the workspace, um, if you look under, like I said, under this, this nav menu on the left, under workspace, uh, under users, um, there should be a, the last line on the password slip. It'll say folder, it'll say slash home, and then slash SICS and some number. Uh, if you look under users, you'll find that, uh, that folder. So for instance, if you're um, SICS number, uh, let's see, number one right here. Uh, let me just open that up into a different, yeah. So you've got a folder there that's a workspace. That's and your workspace. 
Yes, there are privacy controls. Yes. There, there are ACLs in this so that uh, people aren't overriding someone else's uh, uh, programming. Uh, so you have full read and write access on your folder, and then also full read access on some of the course folders, such as SparkCamp. Um, okay, so what I want to do is, as a first exercise is there's a notebook under SparkCamp. It's called 00 Preflight Check. And it's a, it's a very simple program in Spark. It's really just three parts, but it shows the design pattern that, that recurs on Spark applications over and over. It will use the main elements of almost all the Spark elements we do today. So uh, if you go to Spark Camp 00 Preflight Check, then you can clone this. Clone it? Yeah. So for instance, if you open it, um, up at the top it will say clone. And uh, clone the, the whole, the whole uh, notebook? Or? Yeah, clone the whole notebook. Um, I'll, I'll take and clone these one at a time. Uh, you can clone a whole folder for that matter too, but I think just working notebook by notebook is better. Um, but in this case here, uh, go uh, select under users, uh, find your, your uh, folder, um, wherever it is, and then clone it into your folder. And you can change the name of it however you want, wh whatever would be useful. Okay, is that working out okay? Say it's protected or whatever when you go. So you go to your. Just a second. I was, I was just verifying uh, user permissions earlier. Everything looked okay, but I just want to check. Yeah. Like you have that. You should do it. It should, it should be cloned, right? Well, uh, which is your? Uh, yeah. I think it's zero zero. You, you have zero zero one. It must be. Yeah. Oh. That's, that's the one, right? That's yours. Okay. And cool. So yeah. Yeah, and then and then click clone. Yeah, it says protected. Oh, uh, click click this. Click. Ah, I have to click. Yeah, there, there, and now click over there. Huh. Ah, no. Well, may I see? Maybe I don't with some other, with the other number. Huh? Everybody could do it. Yeah, or are, are there is anybody getting a, a protected error, or is this working? Is it working? Okay, is it working for you? Working? Interesting. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll grab another here. Yeah, I grab another, okay. another account. Exactly. If for whatever reason it doesn't, uh, we can always switch accounts. I also have admin. I, I can go in and, and uh, change permissions on anything. Okay. Alrighty. Um, I, so I'd like to show uh, how to use these notebooks then. Um, and I'm going to be working on this. Uh, I'm not going to lock it right away. Um, I will lock it later on, though. Um, but the first thing, after you've cloned a notebook, you'll need to attach it to a cluster. I'll go into this in more detail in a bit. Uh, but one of the nice things here is that there's a, a separation of concerns. Uh, when you're working with a team with notebooks, the state of what you're working on is at the notebook layer. And the clusters that back this, the computational resources, these are considered ephemeral. Um, they can go away at any point in time. Uh, so the whole thing is built to be able to uh, attach and detach clusters very rapidly. Um, so when you first clone a notebook, you have to specify what cluster you want to run it on. Uh, and if you go up to the top left, it should come up in a detached state. If you click this, there'll be a number of different clusters that are running. Uh, just pick one of these. Really, any one of these clusters are large enough to run most of the class. Uh, and uh, we'll, I'll take a look a little bit later and I'll show how to, um, how to evaluate the UI. That's actually taking a long time to associate. Is the Wi-Fi working okay? No? Is anybody having troubles with the Wi-Fi? I should check. Is it? Oh, okay. So far so good there. Um, I attached to Foo3. Okay, yeah, that seems good. I, I haven't used the Wi-Fi at scale here before, so I was just curious about that. Um, all right, once you've got a notebook that's attached to a cluster, then we can execute different parts. And so the way to, to run a cell, uh, if you want to look at an individual cell, um, for instance here, well, we'll see if the Wi-Fi is working. Yeah, the Wi-Fi is getting... Uh, is it getting a little saturated? 
Okay. Um, it might get a bit saturated. Uh, you know, I could. I guess I could probably go onto a different network. I could go onto my my cell. Um, hmm. A lot of what I'll be running, I can just show these. Hi. Password. Yes. Oh, Professor Reed, he's got some up there. Huh. This one worked fine. Is that going? The other one was some predicted for some reason. Interesting, it's not, not updating for me here. Um, for, for a lot of these, I can show the results. I've already got them pre-computed, and I can show them, and I can leave a lot of the operation as homework. Um, and, and these accounts will be running for at least the next week. Um, but... So maybe you would like to get you working on another... Yeah, if it's possible. Oh, there we go. Let me do this one. I get you with this just a second. Um, okay. So at, at least you work properly, huh? And then I can yes. show, oh. yeah. Exactly. So first I want spot on. I put this. Oh, here's, wonderful. Here's the password, huh? Oh, great. Uh, so this will be iPhone and uh, oh. <coughs> we'll make that private. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zero, two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are connected, huh? Yep. Yeah. Great, great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, alrighty. Alrighty. Um, well, let's... Databricks cloud, I I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> um, let's see here. Let's see here. You know what it might be. You are correct. We are connected on the uh, on the hotspot. We have VMs too as a fallback. We can also go back to downloads. Um, hmm. Should I mean try some other web page? See if it's just the web pages. Uh, That's true. That's a good point. You can see if you can. Yep. That loaded. So it is getting, oh, okay, there it is. Interesting, so it takes a little bit to update, um, but at least I can show it this way. Okay, um, what I wanted to show here was really Spark in three parts. So uh, when you take a look at these different cells, the first one up there is a markdown cell. Up at the top it says percent MD, and then what follows is just some markdown text to be able to show a, a title and a paragraph. Uh, Maybe this was a very initial problem where everybody is getting resources on the cloud. Uh, everybody's loading up at once. Yeah, and yeah. once you get your resources, it will be easy then later. It's okay. always the case. Quite common. Yeah, that, that, that sounds right. Um, so I want to show then uh, what, the, what the code is doing, what we're trying to do here. There's really just three parts. Um, so step one, we want to create some collection of data. Um, we'll, go in it, we'll go into this idea in more detail, but with Spark, you're working with, at a base level, something called an RDD, a Resilient Distributed Data Set. You can think of this as being a collection that's distributed, and then you apply functions to the collection. And then you uh, basically chain together applying different functions to create pipelines. Um, so first off, I want to create some type of base data. And uh, this is a Python notebook. So a very simple way to create uh, a collection of data is just to say data equals x range 1 to 10,001. That will create the first 10,000 integers. Uh, and it's just an iterator. There's actually no computation really being done there. Uh, but once we've specified that data, uh, then down here, um, this cell here is, is the actual Python to run it. Um, can everybody see this? Uh, is the contrast okay for the projector? Can you see it in the back? Is the type big enough? Okay, good. Um, can you make it bigger? I can make it bigger, yeah. Okay. So uh, the first thing here 
is just to say data equals x range 1 to 10,001, and then print it out. That would just print out the, uh, the iterator. Um, step two, taking that data, then we'll wrap it with this call to sc.parallelize. And SC stands for Spark Cluster. All of the API for Spark hangs off of this, uh, sorry, the Spark context. All of the API for Spark hangs off of Spark context. And so uh, this variable SC is built into the notebooks. Uh, if you're writing Spark code for a, a standalone app that would be submitted to a cluster, probably the first thing you'd do would be to create a Spark context. Um, but here it's built in. So we'll take the, the data that we had created as an iterator up there. Um, By the way, how to run a cell, you click on one. Uh, you click shift, uh, shift or turn when the cursor is in a cell. And uh, I'm going to actually detach from this cluster. I, I, you know, another thing that I was thinking about is when I started clusters this morning, I created half of them using spot instances, uh, and, uh, which is our default. But the other half I created using dedicated instances. So I'm going to cut over and make sure that I'm on um, not one of the spot instances, just in case that's causing a problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, it's not, it won't save that much money. Um, I, we've created data, we call sc.parallelize, and this will create uh, a definition of an RDD out of data. So data is our base data. This is just a logical definition of it. Um, nothing actually gets computed when you do that. Uh, with Spark, there is this notion of lazy evaluation. So you have your data at the endpoints of a graph. You have your definition of where the base data is at rest. And then you create these RDD definitions and apply functions to them, building out a graph of what needs to be computed. At some point when you actually need a result, then that whole graph gets evaluated. Um, but by virtue of having lazy evaluation, there are opportunities for uh, a number of different types of optimization. Um, so uh, here we just begin to build out this, this graph, a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. Uh, and that RDD will be labeled disk data. And then next up, we'll apply a function to it. Uh, so in this case with Python, uh, we can create a closure using a lambda, lambda expression. Uh, so we'll say x equals data dot filter, and uh, inside of there we'll have a lambda that says uh, evaluate true if x is less than 10. Uh, so we're going to filter and only retain uh, the first 10 integers. Everything else will be discarded. Again, though, nothing's been computed. There's lazy evaluation, so we're just building out this graph of what eventually will be computed. And then down here is the last call. It says uh, x.collect. Uh, so we've taken this RDD that we've projected off of disk data, and now we're going to call it with a function collect, which says uh, return the result set. It's basically running the query. Uh, this is a special part of the API. Collect is an example of something called an action. And whenever you hit an action, that's when the whole graph gets serialized out to the cluster and evaluated, and then the results are what are brought back. So um, the whole graph runs, and the output then is the first, uh, the first nine integers, uh, one through nine. Um, these are really the three essential elements that we'll see over and over uh, in all of the different Spark apps that we'll take a look at today, uh, defining a base RDD that points out to some other data uh, some data at rest or some uh, definition of an iterator, and then applying transformations, uh, functions that can be composed together to create pipelines, and then applying some type of action, some, some terminal function that, that causes a result to be produced. Um, alrighty, any questions about this so far? Okay, good. Um, let me attach to a different cluster the cluster I was running actually is having problems. You see it's yeah, restarting right there. The yeah, that's probably it. So let me check and see about this one. Uh, there's a really large cluster that we had that will run uh, hundreds of people at once. And once that gets attached, Do we'll check it. Do you have authority to run other clusters, or is it uh, Yes, I can, I can launch whatever is needed. And even us, we're sitting here? Or? 
should not be able to. Uh, I, it, they, they should be locked down. So uh, that'll be interesting. If, if anybody's able to go in and start another cluster, uh, I, I should need to know about that. Um, it's not attaching, though, is the only thing. And I don't know if that's network or what. Huh. OK, well, we can still go through the examples here. Um, and I can try one of the other clusters as well. Yeah, full three is, is, is really... Yeah, three is one of the spot instances. So, so by the way, it's not even running. what we're looking at here, let me look at the clusters. If you go to the nav menu, uh, instead of workspace, if you select clusters, then uh, let me drop this down a little bit. It'll show all the different clusters we have running. There's a large community cluster uh, that's, uh, uh, it has 11 nodes. Uh, it only has 10 notebooks on it currently, so not much load at all. Um, number three, actually, yeah, that was a spot instance cluster. Yeah, I think that is a problem. <laughs> so, uh, is everyone here familiar with spot instances on AWS? You heard some? Uh, the notion on, on Amazon, if you're running servers in the cloud, you can use a spot market. And so if they publish a price, you can pay the full price, or you can basically bet to pay less. <laughs> and uh, the, the trouble is, if demand goes up and the prices spike, uh, if the spike price, the, the spot instance price goes above your rate, uh, your server goes away. And uh, so it's, it's a great way to save money when you're doing cluster compute. Uh, and actually, a, or an even better way is to have homogeneous, or sorry, heterogeneous clusters that are part spot and part uh, reserved instance. Uh, in this case here, we were, we were doing just a, a spot cluster, and for whatever reason, it's restarting. So maybe you should do... Yeah, can I've... Can I've people move to another cluster, or can you make it? I, I have, yeah. I'm, I'm on a different okay, So, you can maybe so um, I will... That's not attaching there. Huh. Yeah, I'll try to use a different one, but um, right now, it's not the clusters. The clusters appear to be fine. It's actually connecting to them. I don't know quite what's going on there. Let me try... Yeah, it's a little bit late, long. Oh, there. Okay. I have no idea why this is not. Yeah, it's it's staying in a detached state. It should come back up in seconds. Okay. Well, I can move forward with some of the lectures then, and we'll try to troubleshoot what's going on with the network. Yeah. Um. Okay. So uh, the idea was Spark. Um, just to give some background, um, if you go back into the late 90s, there were companies that were experimenting with uh, horizontal scale-out and commodity hardware. Uh, Unix, sorry, Linux clusters on commodity hardware. So uh, if you look at about 1997, uh, the middle of the year, uh, teams at Amazon and eBay were both taking their main workloads and parallelizing them, moving them on to Linux servers, uh, such that if they had a spike in traffic, they could do horizontal scale out, add more Linux machines to their cluster, and, uh, and therefore scale the apps. Um, and these companies, actually four of them were working on the same type of problem about the same time in 97. Um, Amazon and eBay got very lucky because they, they rolled this out in Q3 of 97, and then Q4 of 97 is when they had their first enormous year of e-commerce traffic during the holiday season then. Um, and so that led to a lot, of, uh, a lot of log files, really, because they had these web apps and they would capture the social interaction of people shopping online as log files. The log files are machine data. And uh, what, what that led to was this notion of uh, aggregating the log files, doing some data mining off of the aggregated results, and then building uh, data products off of that. Uh, classifiers, recommender systems, etc. But applying some type of machine learning at scale uh, to create data products that would enhance the web apps. So you get a kind of flywheel, a kind of virtuous cycle where uh, more and more data led to uh, augmenting better and better recommender systems, hopefully making the experience of Amazon and eBay better. Um, and so that's really, uh, as I look back on the history, that was really where big data started, was this, this uh, spike in the usage of machine data, uh, primarily for 
e-commerce. Um, if you look a few years later, uh, Google is very notable at the time having done this, this same type of work with Linux servers, uh, horizontal scale out, uh, but they were doing much more complex workloads. And they had the problem that uh, back then, circa 2002, they were running largely on, of course, spinning disks. Um, and spinning disks fail at a certain rate. So if you have a, a cluster with 2,000 nodes running, uh, what's the average daily failure rate for servers? Anybody want to take a guess? Any numbers? Two disks. Two disks per day for a 2,000 node cluster. That's good. Any other takers? Let's bracket it. Anything higher? Okay. This was back in 2002, actually. Um, so uh, John Wilkes, who leads the Omega team at Google, uh, I was at a conference with him last year, and he quoted uh, the, the current rate at Google, the failure rate is 10 nodes per day for a 2,000 node cluster. So back in 2002, it was a lot higher. And the idea is that if you have a large pipeline, machine learning pipeline, and it takes a day to compute results, and you have all these servers failing underneath you, you can't just restart it because the probability of completion goes to zero. Um, so what Google did then was they created the GFS, Google File System, uh, to uh, you know, make these, at least make the storage layer uh, much more robust, and then built a compute layer on top of that. MapReduce was one example of being able to do batch processing. Uh, it was really for the fault tolerance, not so much for the speed, uh, but it allowed these, uh, these large-scale pipelines to scale out horizontally in some cases. Um, and there's a couple of the, the uh, early papers out of Google. That was 2002. Um, I've got some other primary sources about MapReduce. Uh, I'm sure we've, there have been other talks about this as well. Uh, but I want to show a timeline. And the idea is that Google was working on this 2002, 2003. The paper was published in late 2004 from MapReduce. Uh, and then that was picked up by the Nutch project. <coughs> if you've used Lucene, uh, that came out of something called Nutch uh, that's now at Apache. And it was a, an open source kind of, uh, or, or an open source version of uh, web crawler and web indexer, uh, search engine. Uh, so they were using an open source version of MapReduce to create the indexes. Uh, and that became Hadoop. And that was adopted by Yahoo in 2006. Um, and then there was very, uh, very rapid growth. Um, I worked early on with Amazon. I was one of the first people doing 100% cloud architectures uh, back in 2006. And this is when Amazon AWS first went public. Uh, and then uh, by 2008, I was leading a team that had the largest Hadoop instance in the cloud. And uh, our team uh, worked as a case study with Amazon for about a year prior to the release of something called Elastic MapReduce, which is where Amazon, of, of course, has run Hadoop in the cloud for, for a number of years. Uh, and we did see a number of, of problems uh, trying to run Hadoop on a, a heavily virtualized environment like Amazon. Uh, but there was this huge growth at that time. And by 2008, 2009, uh, if you look at Hadoop Summit, you know, you start to see IBM and Oracle and all these major companies coming in. Uh, Hadoop just really spiked in adoption. Uh, at about the same time, there were graduate students at Berkeley working on a project called Mesos, which has to do with multi-tenancy on clusters, uh, multi-tenancy for distributed systems. And uh, some of those grad students were being uh, interns at Google, Facebook, Cloudera, uh, companies that were doing a lot of large-scale MapReduce jobs. And uh, they were in a lab called EECS, or sorry, they were in EECS department at Berkeley in a lab called, uh, at the time, Rad Lab. It's now called Amp Lab. Uh, but uh, they got together and uh, they, they needed to have a proof of concept uh, application for Mesos. And so over spring break, they built a, a Scala app to show how to, how to uh, subsume most all of the kinds of applications you could write in Hadoop, uh, but written on top of Mesos running in Scala uh, in a much more efficient way that eliminated a lot of bottlenecks, basically by reducing the number of synchronization barriers. Um, and so that was in 2008, 2009. 
And then they pushed it open source in 2010, uh, and that became Spark. And uh, the project really picked up a lot of steam. By 2014, Spark went top level at Apache and has since become the, the most active project at Apache. Um, so it's interesting because uh, when you look at this trajectory, MapReduce came out of 2002, 2003. Spark really came along almost a decade later. And a lot of the reason for it was to be able to take advantage of a generation of hardware that was almost a, a decade later. So that's actually a question. Um, what has changed in data center technology? What do we have currently for data centers that would not have been available in 2002? Any takers? For commodity hardware, what does, what does current commodity hardware look like? Yeah. Uh, SSDs and a lot of more memory? Perfect, yes. SSDs. So the spinny disk problem is not so much. We've, we've taken care of that problem. And the large memory spaces, of course, are ideal for running very large workloads. Although they do cause some problems as well. We'll talk about that. How about other, other attributes of current hardware? Multicore, yes, very much so. Uh, so it's almost as if you have a cluster just on one processor. Uh, what else? How about networking? What's different now? Yeah, exactly, yeah, gigabit. So, uh, I mean, when you look back to 2002, the kind of problems that Google was resolving with GFS and MapReduce, which subsequently went into the design of Hadoop, um, those were largely about the failures of spinning disks. Um, but now we have multi-core, we have large memory spaces, uh, we have much faster networks, SSDs, etc. So there's, there's been very much a, a different generation of hardware. Um, and looking forward, of course, all, you know, GPUs are very cheap and they, they bring in their own issues as far as being able to run uh, clusters based on them. Um, so Spark grew out of this idea of leveraging the newer generation of hardware. Um, and, and it is challenging because, you know, if you have a large memory space, if you try to take 128 gigs of RAM and throw it at a JVM, it'll just cause a lot of garbage collection, right? So uh, being able to manage beyond the JVM and do a lot of off-heap memory management has been one of the main themes of Spark. Uh, it's, it's one of the harder problems with the current generation of hardware. <laughs> we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, oops, so, yeah. So uh, we, we did see an interesting thing happen around 2009, I guess I'd say. Uh, late, in, uh, late in 2007, there was definitely a move to start having abstraction layers on top of Hadoop. So uh, cascading was one of the first, followed closely by pig, and then followed by hive. There were different types of abstraction layers put on top of MapReduce to make it simpler to program. Uh, and then moving into, uh, uh, I guess, about 2009, 2010 timeframe, we started to see a lot of specialized systems evolve. So a problem was that MapReduce is good for doing batch processing if you can guarantee data independence in your job. Um, but there are other types of use cases that were needed that didn't really fit. And so there's kind of a pattern here where uh, the tendency was Google would publish a paper and other people would scramble to create the open source version of it. So, you know, Google published MapReduce and then Hadoop got implemented. Google published the Pregel paper and then Apache Giraffe comes out of that, uh, GraphLab, etc. cetera. Uh, the Dremel paper leading to Drill, F1 to Impala, uh, Millwill, and then different types of streaming coming after that. Um, and now that's not entirely 100% true. I think Millwall paper wasn't published until after, but yeah. it's still that, that philosophy. Uh, so the point here is you can do a lot with batch, but the business cases are demanding other things beyond batch. They're demanding graph processing, um, more interactive queries, uh, large numbers of iterations, especially for machine learning workloads, uh, streaming, going into real-time analytics, et cetera. And a big problem here, there are a number of costs associated as you begin to specialize the systems. So if you, if you have a large scale application and you have uh, maybe your initial data is coming in on streaming and then from there 
perhaps you do some SQL to clean up or do some ETL. And then from there, perhaps you do some graph processing uh, to extract certain features. And then from there, perhaps you do some MapReduce to train a predictive model. Um, if you're bouncing between five different clusters uh, at scale, it causes some problems. Number one, it's expensive to run all those machines. Running a lot of clusters is costly. Uh, number two, learning curve. Uh, you have to train your people to use a number of different systems. And as well, you have to have the operations staff to, to maintain a number of different complex systems. Um, but number three, there's a, a kind of tax, a wire tax is how I would call it. Um, the idea is that bouncing between different clusters to do your processing will incur some time to move the data. And with some of the larger applications, you can measure revenue loss in, sec in, uh, in milliseconds. Uh, when you look at advertising and finance and security, uh, really you have to have responses in, on the order of tens of milliseconds. So um, a lot of the demand then looking into uh, you know, the rise of, of, of Spark since, since 2009, 2010, a lot of that has been to try to take these different use cases and collapse them down into one generalized engine. And uh, so that was the notion. Uh, the original papers are here, uh, basically leveraging the multi-core and large memory space uh, class of machines by, by using working set theory. Uh, so that's from Matei Zaharia, uh, was the principal on Spark. And then the next paper, um, RDDs, Resilient Distributed Data Sets. Um, and in terms of, of trying to show this, uh, trying to visualize this, um, the idea is that there is one core, core API that manages uh, RDDs. Um, there's another API over the top of that that gives it a data frame abstraction. And then from there, uh, you can map different types of use cases on top of this very conveniently. So uh, if you have SQL workloads, SQL is a declarative language. There are parts of SQL that are, are close to being functional language. Uh, it's relatively simple to go from a complex SQL query into an expression of that as a, a pipeline in a functional programming language. Um, how many folks have used .NET? Any .NET programmers? OK, have you used Link? Ever seen Link? So if you haven't seen it, Link is a way in, uh, in, in Microsoft programming uh, to be able to take a very complex query and uh, represent it in uh, F sharp, represent it in a, a functional programming. And it's, it's a way to simplify, but also add a lot more programmatic control. Um, it also allows for different types of optimizations. And so uh, there was a project called Dryad Link uh, that came out of Microsoft Research that uh, was looking beyond Hadoop, beyond MapReduce, and that very much informed Spark. Um, but it, it does show how to go from SQL and then map that back down into functional programming. So whatever you could do in SQL, you could do down here in the core with RDDs. And then the result sets that you get out of a query are also RDDs. So you can go back and forth between relational tables and functional programming. Um, Spark streaming is a way of saying, I'm going to have uh, receivers coming into a cluster, these pipelines of data coming in, and I'll establish what's called a micro-batch, a, a time window on the order of seconds, typically. Uh, any data that gets received during that time window is considered to be an RDD. And so downstream from that, the processing is much like you would do with batch in Spark. Um, also, MLlib and other types of, of machine learning libraries on top of Spark. Uh, the notion there is that when you're training machine learning uh, models, typically you're working with vectors or with matrices. Uh, and of course, the evaluation or the, or the, uh, the feature vectors going in to, to score a model, those will be vectors. Uh, so there's a very nice correspondence between the notion of a vector and an RDD. Uh, so we can do distributed learning at scale with uh, MLlib. And that is better than what uh, my teams working with Hadoop would have done before. Um, previously with Hadoop, we would typically sample the data down and build a model on a single server and then distribute the model. Um, with Spark, uh, now you can be doing the learning at scale in a distributed fashion. Question? Not a question. No? The cluster is working now. It's working now? Yes. Goodness, so, so what's going on? Uh, Actually, uh, cluster three. That's what you Oh, it, it, it came back. Yeah, exactly. Mm. 
and I'm, I'm attached. Um, it's 4.3, It's 10 a.m., which would translate to 11-hour shift. What time is it in San Francisco? I'm trying to think if we hit a maintenance window. 1 a.m.? We might have hit a maintenance window, but they were told not to mess with this. Um, so they're, I, I can... Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank so you. I was all my, the time not listening to you track to me. <laughs> my, <laughs> my my day suddenly got better. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So here I can go back and show some of this now. If if I'm in a cell and I, I hit shift or turn, uh, it'll evaluate that cell. In this case, it's markdown. Um, So let's try another one here. If I'm in this cell here where I create an RDD, uh, if, I, if I click in the cell and then do shift or turn, uh, it'll evaluate that. In this case here, it doesn't actually compute results. It just builds out the graph. So it tells you that it has an RDD. And then uh, let's try one of these down here. Why are we getting an error on that? Let me see which, uh, which one is this? This is. Pre-flight? Yeah, pre-flight. Why is that? Which, which, maybe you didn't run every cell. So yeah, you, probably so. So you, you didn't have uh, the other you thing. The previous cells. If you don't the other thing too is that this one here we have I have opened it up so that everybody can have access, uh, and I should probably lock down the right access or execution access. Mm -hmm. I think that multiple people are running at the same time. Step two, and then step three. It's a filter. Yeah. Everybody run this filter, guys? Come on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then collect. And then uh, something got deleted. So if I wanted to collect. Collect is working now? Should be. Yes, question. When I come back again, when I click on uh, my name, it comes to test page, not, not this page. Let's see. Let's take a look. If you don't come back to this page again, the main... Oh, interesting. It comes up with a test. Let me show. This is something else. Um, interesting. Well, what that shows is that there's actually been a notebook created at a top level. My, my user is 39. Here, ah, so you want to create inside? Okay, oh, you you've got, you've got that. Inside the virtual box. Yeah. You should not work inside the virtual box. You just run on the web when you're immediately. Huh? For virtual box? How's that? I mean, they were running an, uh, within an, uh, a VM. Ah, got it. Run, 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 run on your web, on your machine. Forget about everything. Huh. That's fine. Okay. What is not working here? Um, not sure. I'm not not actually sure. I'm not getting a lot of response back. It would run for a while and then. Okay, now what, I'm back. What is the comma? Well, working? part of the problem is uh, this is supposed to be locked down, but we're having several people executed at different at, at mm. the same time. Um, mm. I could clone it into my own directory. Mm, um, it's working. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. So, so the problem is that we actually have like 12 people. <laughs> There's contention because uh, several people are executing different parts at the same time. I attached to 401, so it works. Which one? You attached to what? Uh, 401. Can you attach to 401? It's working. Now I try it. It, it should be working here. Uh, As well. It seems there are many users. Are kind of yeah, several people are running at the same time. And they haven't fixed that. Up. And I get, I get. Huh. See what I mean is, I, somebody else just went in to try to execute that. Okay, so I, I, I could ask, please, please, please don't go into the instructor copy. Um, it should be locked. It is not. Uh, but if you, if you could, please don't go into. Yeah, go to your directory and run there, because if we have several people recomputing the same cells at the same time, it's hard to keep track. Um, <laughs> This should be locked, but it isn't. Huh. OK, what's going on? 
temp args were getting uh, p4j. That's actually a, a Java client problem. Um, I'll have to find out what's going on. Let me let me try a different cluster. You were saying that number four works. See, and it's being this is impossible. Okay. So did you create a copy in some home folder, by the way, because it works here in the home folder? Yeah. You know what I'm thinking I'm going to do is let me cut over into a, a different place. I'm going to run a different uh, different version of this already. And then I can I can at least show it. Yeah, I think it's working fine. It's just um, the way they had their permissions set up aren't the best. They've deleted this. Okay, um, I'll have to get that in the break then. Let me let me go through and we'll have a coffee break. I can go through some lectures though first. Um, but yeah, the, let's get back to this. It does seem to be working for individuals, but not for, yeah, for, not for instructor. Okay. Sorry, did you have a question? Or did somebody have a question? No, sorry, I ended up. Okay, um, let me go through this. Uh, anyway, there's a, a number of different things that will integrate with Spark. Uh, one of the, the big uh, themes of Spark, it'll run on a number of environments. So you could run it on Mesos, you can run it on Yarn, you can run it standalone. Uh, there's integrations with Spring and OpenStack and others. Uh, in terms of data sources, uh, there are connectors to be able to draw data directly out of JDBC or out of HBase, Cassandra, uh, using Parquet serialization, uh, coming off of Kafka streams, etc. Uh, and then for different types of, of programming uh, environments up on top, uh, again, you can be working in Python, Scala, uh, but there's a number of different libraries as well. So, for instance, um, H2O is a, a popular implementation of, of various machine learning algorithms. Uh, Mahout has, had been doing uh, machine learning algorithms for Hadoop, but they've cut over to implementing in Spark primarily now. Um, so a lot of different types of integrations. Um, as far as contributors per month, we've seen a fairly exponential growth. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a drop in the last uh, a couple of months in there because all the data hadn't come in yet. But, uh, well, no, actually, that was holiday season. Um, but you can see over time, it really hit a knee. Um, it, was, it was about the latter part of 2013 is when the growth really started to accelerate. And uh, there was a, a world record. There's something called the gray sort challenge, which is a, a 100 terabyte sort. Um, Yahoo had held the record before using Hadoop. Um, they had run that on proprietary uh, dedicated data center, and uh, they had used uh, over 2,000 nodes in a cluster, and uh, the Spark team was able to beat this. Uh, they ran three times faster on about one-tenth the size of the cluster, and this was run on EC2. Uh, there were three pull requests that were used uh, for uh, beating the record, and uh, so it's it's something you can, if, if you want to fire up 200 nodes in EC2, uh, you can use those pull requests and, and uh, recreate this. Um, but uh, all the hardware specs have been published as far as what they were doing. Uh, basically, you see about a 30x improvement uh, compared with Hadoop at this kind of scale, or at least for this type of workload. Uh, they, they did it for the gray sort challenge at 100 terabyte, and then they went back and, and uh, increased that and did it with one petabyte. Uh, the other thing I should note is that Spark does a lot of work in memory. It can leverage large memory spaces. They had turned off a lot of the, the memory features to be able to get a fair comparison with Hadoop. Um, so it can actually run faster than this. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely uh, late 2013 is when we see a real spike. This is uh, Donnie Burkholtz. I uh, did this analysis off of Stack Overflow. Um, Spike on what? Uh, just overall activity of uh, Spark. We had seen Hadoop and Yarn, of course, were getting a lot of traction over time, but in late 2013, um, the Spark activity just really picked up. We see the same thing in the commits. We see the same thing with the conference activity. And uh, O'Reilly uh, data science team uh, in 2014, last year, had done a study. So the median salaries uh, out of the U.S. were uh, higher for Spark than other. So, um. <laughs> so if you are 
spark proficient you can get one. <laughs> <laughs> you can get a job now in the US. <laughs> And, uh, and, and a very good survey came out of TypeSafe. I think this is interesting. TypeSafe uh, did uh, a comprehensive study about different types of tools used for big data. And uh, I definitely recommend that. Um, but it goes into more detail about running Spark. TypeSafe is like a company promoting Scala. Yeah, ty TypeSafe created, uh, and I'm not sure what they're called, they're changing their name, um, but I do some work with TypeSafe. Uh, but they uh, create the Scala environment and a lot of the, the framework. Uh, Spark was originally based off of leveraging a lot of this, right, with Akka, um, et cetera. And Akka was built in Sweden here, actually. Akka was built in Sweden? Yeah. Ah, OK. Yeah, uh, is, is there much work here? Uh, reactive streams and all is that is reactive a lot of work being done here. Uh, That's more uh, Switzerland. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, there there is. If you want to clone this example, let me show more about how Spark works as a distributed system. Um, if you want to clone and run uh, in your folder, it's zero one dot log example. I've got the output captured on slides. Um, I just want to show. Here's an example program that would take some log files and run some type of rollup on the log files. Uh, I've got an S3 bucket that's mounted up there of uh, uh, log4j formatted, tab separated log files. And uh, what this program will do is uh, first define the base RDD. So we use sc.txt file and we'll read in the text from the log files. And uh, again, nothing happens. This is just specifying a graph that will be evaluated eventually. But we defined where the data is at rest. Uh, it applies a map to that. And so the lambda expression there will split each, uh, each row will be split on tab. So you get a tuple. Um, and that gives us an RDD called lines. Uh, and then building out from there, we'll do a transformation. We'll take lines and we'll apply a filter uh, to take a look at the first column in each tuple, if the first column says error, like log4j format, uh, it could be error, it could be warning, could be notify, things like that. Uh, but if it says error, we'll retain it, otherwise throw it away. That creates an RDD called errors. Nothing has happened. All we've done is to build out a graph. Uh, and then here, the next one, we'll say messages equals errors.map. I uh, will basically peel off the second column off of each tuple, which is where the error message itself is. We already know that the first column is error, so that's redundant. So we'll just keep this, this RDD here messages of what the actual error texts were. Um, so we've built three different RDDs that depend on each other, but nothing has happened yet. Um, it's just a logical description. Um, as far as the compiler is concerned, the first two RDDs really never need to exist. They aren't going to be used further into the program. But they're good for debugging. They're good for us to think of as programmers. Uh, this line here takes the messages RDD. And there's a directive here from the programmer. Uh, there's a directive to say, cache it if possible. So when the program gets to this part, um, if you have memory available, take the results, each partition out in the worker nodes in the cluster, and cache it there. Um, if you don't have memory, there's a way, there are rules for how to handle that, too. Uh, and then down here, we've got two actions. So remember with Spark, I was saying there are, uh, there are two different types of things in the API. There are transformations that are lazy, of functions that are applied to data. And then there are actions when you need a piece of data as a result, as an output. Um, actions cause the graph to be evaluated. So the first action will say messages.filter and we'll take a look and see if we can find the keyword MySQL in the error text. And uh, for basically for all the error messages that have MySQL in them, we'll count those. Count is an action. And then the, that count will be dropped out on the console. Um, so we're going to see how many errors have to do with MySQL. And then likewise, how many errors have to do with PHP. Um, when this runs. Now, it could be part of the graph, right? Right, but the way the, I mean, the semantics of the API count is an aggregation that that's done as an act, as an action. Mm -hmm. But then you lose some optimization opportunities, right? No, there's lazy evaluation. Yeah, yeah but still, among 
between the counts, because if you could have, I'm thinking of a SQL query now. Oh, if, you, if you're doing subsequent, you, 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 can, you can do that. This is functional programming land, not, not SQL land. When we get into SQL, yes, you can. You can do that, and it would not have to be an action at that point. Anyway, like, count, return the result to the driver. Basically. Yeah, just like in Scala. Mm -hmm. okay. So it, th okay. this, this is the part that's just, patterned after Scala and closures. Um, you can sum by other things, but count especially the tenders up. So uh, when you're first running, uh, we have the client side, the driver. So uh, if you're running off of a laptop, the driver would be your laptop. Uh, if you're running the notebooks, the Spark context is in your notebook. That's the driver. But then you've got this cluster here. You've got some worker nodes. Um, so I wanted to show a separation between driver and worker. When we get up to the first part of this program, up to declaring the persistence, uh, nothing is run, nothing is executed. All you've done is to build out a graph. But when you fit, when you, uh, oh, actually I should mention, when you look at the cluster, we're going to assume that the log files are distributed out there in, in um, HDFS, some type of distributed storage. Uh, so each different worker will have its own blocks of data. With Spark, we're really trying to move the computation to the data. Um, now, when you get to the first action, that's when we need to serialize the graph out to the cluster. Uh, so again, taking the compute out to the data. Uh, each different worker then will read its blocks of data uh, and begin to apply the graph to its own partition. And so we'll do some processing, and we get to this point where we say messages.cache. Um, each different worker will attempt to cache the process data into memory, if it has memory available. We don't know that for sure, but it will try. Um, and then, since we're doing a count, that's a kind of partial aggregate. So each different worker has its own counts, and those are all sent back to the driver and added together to get the final count, to get the, the full count. Um, now, when we do the second action, uh, the, the graph has already been serialized out to the cluster, and the messages RDD is already in cache on the different workers. So instead, the driver just sends out a message to each worker saying, OK, pick up from this part of the graph. So they'll process from cache, not from disk, and they'll send down their partial aggregates. And as you're running these, uh, you should be able to see there's about an order of magnitude difference between the first action and the second action. And the effect here is that we don't have to go back to disk all across the cluster. Um, so this is a very important point. It's a simple illustration of it, but it, it again, talks to that generational difference between Hadoop and Spark. Um, with Hadoop, you have three synchronization barriers for every job step, or three potential synchronization barriers. You take your data, you read it off of disk, you lift it up into memory, you apply some kind of map, a flat map, uh, as we would say in Scala. Uh, and then you've got a synchronization barrier also going from the results of the map out to a shuffle sort phase. And then you have another barrier going from there into the reduce, and then from there being dropped down into disk. So at these various points in the Hadoop job step, you have to wait and synchronize all the processing before you can move on. Uh, when you look at complex Hadoop applications, uh, when I had a team that had, like I said, the, the largest Hadoop instance in the cloud, we had a large ad network. We were doing a large collaborative filter for behavioral targeting in the ad network. And we had 15 job steps. They were organized as a DAG, is how we looked at it. But there were 15 job steps. Each job step had these synchronization barriers. But when you really analyze the code, if you start to think of it as you would a SQL query, what you find is that you don't need all the synchronization barriers. Um, in a lot of cases in complex Hadoop apps, you'll see patterns such as map, 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 reduce. And so um, it's possible then um, to think of this differently. With Spark, because of the lazy evaluation, uh, if there is no need for the synchronization barriers, then instead what Spark will do is just compose the functions together do them all as one unit of work. And so you're reducing a lot of synchronization barriers. You're able to get better pipelining across the cluster. Um, the effect is much the same as in processors. Uh, to be able to get fast pipelining on a processor, uh, you want to warm up the cache, and you, you want to eliminate wait states. So Spark is about applying that across a cluster.
Okay, any questions about that? Um, did the log file example, is that running okay? Did you run? The execute? No, it had errors. It had errors? Yes. What is going What's on that? with this thing? Similar to the job where you had. Mine went through fine. Yours went through okay? Hmm? For me, everything went through fine. Yeah, yeah, I ran that too. It was completely fine. Okay, I can take a look at break and, and yeah. see what, what those errors are. That is strange. Huh. Um, okay. Uh, let's take this a little further. Um, word count. Is everybody familiar with word count? Just a count. Just a yeah. question. Um, so this is a, would be available for the student for how long time that they can... A week. Huh? Yeah, a week. So you have these examples. All you can run in your pace. Yeah. Huh? In all the examples. You just have to clone it in your... <laughs> exactly, yeah. You can clone. And, and there are more examples out of learning SparkBook and out of the... Exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, there are a lot more examples actually under Spark Camp than what we'll cover in the class. Yeah. Just, just that the, yeah. if they don't do it now, they can do it later. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a hunch that there are network timeouts for some reason, and hopefully outside of the class, then yeah. there'll be better network coverage. Um, is everybody familiar with word count? Yes. Everybody. Okay, <laughs> it's a, it's a canary in a coal mine. We've seen it too many times. Um, if you look at pseudocode for Hadoop, it's shown on the right. It's interesting because it has symbolic processing, it has numeric processing, uh, it has parts that are trivial to parallelize, it has parts that are non-trivial to parallelize. So if you can run uh, word count in parallel at scale, you have some guarantees that a much more interesting class of problems could also run efficiently in parallel at scale. Um, so for instance, if you look at TF-IDF, it's just a few steps beyond word count. You can, you can build a TF-IDF pipeline out of word count pretty simply. Um, if you look at word count that ships with Hadoop, it's 53 lines of Java, and it looks like this. <laughs> um, if you look at the same thing done in Spark, it's three lines. And so we do see a, a dramatic reduction in the volume of code, and that's important for software engineering because if you, can, if you can see this kind of order magnitude reduction in code volume, you'll have less bugs over time, less code to maintain, less cost for a different team to pick up the code and, and work with it. Um, and so that's a real value, not just Spark, so but of functional programming in general. We have seen uh, Hadoop and they understand uh, the concept of Hadoop in the first day. You can maybe just mention that like, reduced by key will do the combiner automatically. Hmm? Yeah, that's a good point. So if you're, if you're familiar with map, reduce, and combine, um, then I mean, we'll, we'll look at this program a little bit more. But up at the top, to do a word count, uh, we'll have some sort of input path for the data. We call sc.txt file on that to create an RDD called f. And then uh, the way this is implemented is we'll say f.flatmap. Uh, so is everyone here familiar with the difference between a map and a flat map? Uh, flat map is a functional programming concept. Or I, I can just say it very quickly okay. because a map takes an element, each element map it to another element. A flat map takes an element and map it possibly to a set of elements. Huh? Right, so zero or more. Zero or more. Zero or more. more. So I, the map in a list of elements. the map in MapReduce is a flat map. Mm -hmm. um, so what we'll say then is that uh, f up at the top, the RDD called f is going to be an RDD of strings, each line out of a file. Uh, each element is a line out of a file. Um, we'll take and do a flat map on that. So we'll say for each element, split it on space, give us keywords. And uh, then from there, we'll apply a map. So for each word, we're going to reshape it as word comma one, as a tuple. Uh, and then we'll cache that. We'll tell it, if possible, keep it in memory. Um, not necessarily needed, but we'll use it later. Uh, and then the third line says W reduced by key. Uh, and so we're going to take effectively sorting all these key value pairs. And so for each key, for each, each word, uh, we're going to find all of its ones. And then we have a way to add these together in parallel. Um, and the way that, that reduced by key works is by leveraging a, a monoid kind of a pattern. Um, the idea is that you have a, a binary associative operator, plus, and you can do this in parallel across a cluster. So if you try to do an, an addition in a loop, uh, there's order and time that it costs to do the addition in a loop. If you do it as a tree on a cluster, you have order log and time. Um, so by applying a kind of monoid, which is required 
for reduced by key, then you can parallelize this summation. <clears throat> and then the last thing it says save as text, so it'll just write out uh, all the word counts to some particular path. I just want to say it is more efficient than, than it looks because when they are producing this, when you start an action, when you produce this list of words with one, automatically you are running after that pipeline the reduce by locally. So it does not really produce all the lists of ones in one machine and then sum it. It does it like, it does it like pipeline, uh, locally. And then after right. that, you send it to the. Mm, mm. Right. So so uh, it's that's. More a, than it looks, just yeah, that that's an interesting point. Is re the the reduced by the the aggregates in Hadoop are typically on the reduce part mm -hmm. of MapReduce. Uh, in Spark, that's not necessarily the case. And here, reduce by is actually a transformation, so there's actually lazy evaluation on it. Yeah. So it doesn't happen right away, so there's opportunities to optimize it. Okay. Um, there's, a, a, if you want to look at this in more detail, yeah. there's a notebook for that. Um, I want to show the join example, though. That's getting a bit more interesting. Uh, so let me go back over here to join. Um, Um, the idea here, I'm going to keep this locked, but if you want to clone it and run it on yours, that, that's good too. Uh, here I've got two files. Uh, so this is looking at, if you've seen a marketing funnel before, where typically you've got impressions and then clicks and some sort of conversion. And there may be more stages than that, but um, here we're going to do a join like we would see at one stage of a marketing funnel. Uh, we've got people who are clicking on some ad and then they click onto a landing page and they'll take an action. Maybe they'll register for a service online. Uh, so we have two files. One of them has the clicks, and the other has the registrations. Um, if you take a look at click.tsv, <clears throat> we're going to reshape that file. We're going to create an RDD here called uh, click, CLK. We're going to read in the, uh, the, the click data and then split it on tabs so we have tuples. Um, if you take a look at it, it's very small. It's just two rows. Um, and each row has these three elements here. You've got a timestamp, a UID, and uh, an ad ID. Um, to be able to do some type of large-scale aggregation in Spark, typically we need to reshape the data into a key value pair. Um, if you're doing SQL queries at scale in Spark, it does this automatically for you. Uh, but I want to show the mechanism. So we'll take the click data and we'll reshape it. So we'll pull out the, uh, the UID as, uh, as the key and then the, the whole tuple as the value. And so that's called click pairs. And now we'll do the same thing with the registration data. Um, read it and uh, split it on tabs. We've got tuples. It's a little bit more complex, but it also has timestamp and UID. Um, so we'll reshape that in the same way and create reg pairs. So we now have two different key value pairs uh, two different RDDs as key value pairs describing these data sets. If we want to join them, we can join on the UUID uh, simply by saying reg pairs join click pairs. Um, now, an interesting thing is nothing happens until down here you say collect. Okay, so we've set up this whole pipeline, but because of lazy evaluation, nothing happens to get to this point. Um, so there could be optimizations inside of there. Um, now, if we take a look at this graphically, it would be like this here. Uh, when, we, when we run collect, then the graph is going to be sent out, serialized out to the cluster. And the way that Spark looks at it, um, the, there's two sides to the join. There's left-hand side and right-hand side. So let's say the clicks are left-hand side. Uh, so we, we do a map and a map on the clicks to be able to reshape it. And the graph is decomposed into three stages here. So the stage one will will sh reshape the clicks file. Stage two will reshape the registration file. These two are independent, so they could be run in parallel. And so Spark will be managing uh, the tasks, scheduling the tasks, so you could get some nice parallelism out of that. Um, when you get to the point of having to do the join, you have to make sure that for each key you can see all of its values, for the left-hand side and the right-hand side, respectively. So that's why you have a third stage here for the join. Um, what that also implies is the join could be expensive. It could cause a lot of network traffic. 
And there are ways around that. Uh, you can do some interesting partitioning and repartitioning uh, based on the keys. Uh, there are ways to do this in Spark that will cut down the amount of potential network overhead. Um, uh, another thing is that depending on what we had run before, uh, elements of this may have been cached because of previous use. Probably not with this program, but you can imagine that if you had more complex pipelines, you may have some elements cached. And an interesting thing with Spark is that you don't have guarantees that the RDD, all of the different partitions will be, par will be cached. Um, there is a notion of, uh, of an LRU, least recently used, so uh, a given worker node may evict a partition if it's not being used. Um, so there's a fairly complex environment out on the cluster as far as what is or is not cached, but Spark will try to take advantage of that as much as possible. That's where the working set theory comes in. Okay, any questions about this? Alrighty. Um, how are we doing for time? It's uh, maybe after five minutes we can take a coffee break. Perfect. Okay, so I'll, I'll lead this up, and then I've got. If if the network allows us, um, we've got a, a programming exercise. Try to pull this together. Um, so let me give some uh, setup on this. Um, so we're working with Databricks Cloud. One thing I want to illustrate is uh, you do these logins. So you, we call it a shard, and you have a team that's logging in to a shard, and you've got some collection of notebooks, and the state is associated with notebooks. And the notebooks are being attached to clusters, or you can detach them attached to another. Um, and um, basically, we, we've decoupled the state of the notebooks from the clusters. That way, if the cluster fails, you can resume with another cluster. Um, I'd like to show how to use Databricks Cloud, how to use notebooks with respect to something called computational thinking. Uh, anybody worked with uh, CT? computational thinking before? Has anybody seen this? CMU is using it for their uh, computer science program. It's, it's really based off of Seymour Papert uh, and uh, Marvin Minsky uh, going back a number of years ago. But uh, Jeanette Wing, out of the chair of uh, CMU Computer Science, had popularized this. Um, and Google has some great uh, resources based on computational thinking. Um, the idea is that you take a hard problem and you're going to create a, a structured description of how to solve it. So uh, these are a way of thinking about a problem, creating notes for yourself, creating notes for your team, but making them executable. Um, the idea is that you take the difficult problem, decompose it into small problem, small solvable pieces, uh, and then pattern recognition is the next step. You identify for each small piece how you could solve it. Uh, effectively, how does it correspond to an API that could be used to solve the small problems? And then abstracting out from there, um, abstract those patterns into a, a generalized strategy, build a, a pipeline. And then from there, being able, able to run the whole thing as a unit of work, um, effectively, this is a way of, of articulating algorithms. So this is a way to go from a text description to something that's runnable, uh, effectively as an algorithm. So with notebooks, we like to think of it as this way. Create a new notebook, copy the assignment as markdown into a notebook cell, and then refine the problem, split the markdown into separate pieces uh, that are relatively simple to, to solve individually. Um, and so for each one of those, uh, take and create a new cell underneath your markdown with a code uh, that will run it. And then from there, start to uh, align the pieces so they all fit together. Uh, make sure you can run each step in sequence and get the right results out of it. Um, so this is a way to apply computational thinking with notebooks. And uh, we find it works pretty well. Um, to, sh to illustrate this, we'll have a coding example after the break, uh, but basically this builds on the last four examples that we had. Um, so we've got a couple of files here. Uh, for each one, uh, create an RDD and uh, filter each RDD on the keyword Spark. So for each line, uh, filter out uh, to make sure that the line contains the keyword Spark. And then for each different branch of this here, uh, perform a word count. The results of the word count are going to be key value pairs, keyword and count, and then just join those together. 
Um, so this will be a way to see how many counts of the word Spark are in these respective files. Um, but it'll pull together the, the pieces that we've shown so far. It'll, it'll show how to do an aggregation in Spark. Um, any questions about that? Okay, we're, we're up on time for just about for break? Yeah, let's take a break. Is that good? Okay.